the audience. So we'll just let them connect slowly. And we'll start in another minute or so. Too much paperwork in Germany. I'm so I'm so happy you said that. I don't want to even show you. I'm showing you Christina Blyle's office behind me. She's managed to get on top of her paperwork. If I turn the computer, it's a mess. A mess. I'm overwhelmed. That means, generally speaking, you're doing a lot of work. I mean, that's what happens. I'm sure you're both very productive. Okay, uh, no, look at the shelves. No, no, Mansoor. Look at the shelves behind me. And look at the shelves behind uh, Professor Schroeder. It's a different story altogether. <laughs> that's productive in Germany. This is... Gem German organization. <laughs> Wonderful. When have you been last time in Beirut? It's been about two or three years, actually. I need to go back, but it's tricky. I can't, like, I can't stay on top of my work. If I go to my own house, um, the electricity is a major nightmare. So I think I might have to go down, visit my own house, and then go to a hotel. <laughs> so I've got electricity. Yeah, Jack said he, I should go there. I have never been in Lebanon. Jack Marcus, I definitely, no. I'd give it a little bit longer, although right now the currency, whatever currency you have, you know, anything that's not Lebanese pounds is so strong, but I would give it a little bit longer until there's a tiny little bit more stability and it is beautiful. You know, we'll just make sure that you can visit some of the... Um... So you will organize a bike tour through the Lebanon, all right? No, that's dangerous. I think, you know, a lot of people used to go and so back in the war, they'd go and about two or three of them never came back. Really? Because they went knowing that some of them will die riding. Oops, Oops. no, this is too early. Exactly. Yeah, I know. Some it's years. always too early to die like that. So, God forbid. Friends, um, yes. let's begin. Um, oh, nice to see you, Ahmad. So, welcome to everybody. Welcome the friend, to the friends around the world. Welcome to the friends who are watching via other channels and uh, other avenues. And um, and to those who will um, enjoy the, the webinar later on, 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 on the recorded mode. Um, a huge thank you to the panel, and I'd like to welcome first our new panel member, um, a very uh, wonderful consultant that I've heard much about over several years, uh, Mr. Basil Zabian, consultant pediatric and adult neurosurgeon from King's College Hospital in London, uh, which is a very large unit and one of the um, uh, superb units with a lot of um, experience in the field of neuroendoscopy. Uh, and uh, thank you to him to join the panel and uh, uh, take this uh, neuroendoscopic field forward uh, with some of the stars in the field, uh, in the international field, who are with us today. And a huge welcome once again to Henry, Henry Schroeder. Professor Henry Schroeder needs no introduction. I introduced him so many times, people around the world know him for his uh, excellent wisdom and experience in this field uh, and his uh, brilliant presentations and teaching. Uh, and of course, Professor Ahmad Zohra, Zohdi from, from Egypt and Cairo. So grateful that uh, Ahmad, you could join again, one of the international experts in this field, huge experience and a brilliant teacher. Um, and when I said the duet between them has been really good in so many uh, uh, places that we've enjoyed. Uh, the subject for today is regarding neuroendoscopic surgery for colloid cyst, uh, a subject which is very uh, dear to me and, uh, and, a, and, a, and an excellent example of the uh, importance of this skill set and this this field which is developing so without further ado i will hand over to to basil welcome and welcome to everybody uh, before i go just a little mention if we have a little connection difficulty um we will uh cope with that i know ahmed you've had some difficulty joining in uh, with the connection i hope everything's fine if it is uh, difficult i'm sure henry will uh, continue with the presentations but uh, good to see you all and welcome Thank you very much, Mansoor. And I just want to say a thank you for inviting me, for your kind words, and for all your hard work and your efforts in organizing this and putting it all together. I think it's fair to say that you manage sometimes, you know, getting some of us uh, together to sort things out, especially on my side is like herding cats. And you did that very well. So you managed to herd me in the right direction. So thank you very much. And as you say, neither Professor Schroeder nor Professor Zohdi need any introduction. 
uh, both eminent in the fields and actually giants in neurosurgery and neuroendoscopy. Uh, so I think without further ado, um, I will hand over to Professor Schroeder, who's going to start by talking to us about uh, the technique really of, of, of colloid cyst resection and a little bit more uh, about colloid cysts. And then Professor Zohadi, who's got some really interesting twists on the whole topic. Um, and I will just mute myself and stop my video. And if you guys have any questions, by all means, write them down. I'll try and stay on top of it in the chat and keep it to the end so it doesn't interrupt, unless it's something that's really topical to what the presenters are saying, then we'll try and stop briefly and address those questions. So Professor Schroeder, thank you very much for joining us and over to you. Thanks, Bess, for the kind introduction. Mansour, thank you for organizing this series of webinars, which I think cover important aspects. And of course, I'm happy that Ahmed Zodi is with me, who are, is a longtime friend of mine and also very experienced in any endoscopic surgery. So the topic, what we discuss today is the endoscopic resection of colloid cysts. I think colloid cysts are a very nice indication for an endoscopic approach because they are apparent usually at the foramen of Monroe. But as you can see here, the appearance of the cyst at the foramen is very variable. Sometimes it's very suitable for an, for an endoscopic approach like in this cyst here, because it's apparent in the foramen, dilating it very much, but sometimes it's hidden, you just see plexus. Sometimes it's more in the septum and makes the foramen small because the fornix is pushed down. And then it's not good to come from this area. So it, the most important thing in the endoscopic treatment of colloid cysts, in my opinion, is the right indication. So you have to look at the images very precisely. And that is frequently not done. It is a standard or the colloid cysts become endoscopically. And then sometimes you have problems to deal with it. And that may result to fornix injury. And this can lead to memory problems. And that is what we don't want to have. That's why we have to make an individual decision. You know, individualized medicine is now very, um, very trendy in medicine, but we do it for many years already because each approach is planned accordingly. Sometimes the location is a little bit strange. You see here, this is in the velum interpositum, the colloid cyst. Of course, this is not a good indication come endoscopically because it's all covered here by neural tissue. And here we made an interhemispheric approach subsplanial and open the cyst from here. But this is a rarity. This is the only, only cyst what I have seen in my career in this location. So what is the indication? I think we all agree that symptomatic cysts should be treated. Asymptomatic cysts with signs of CSF pathway obstruction, in my opinion, should also be treated. I don't wait until they become symptomatic. But when we have asymptomatic cysts and no ventricular dilation, then usually we advise for observation. Sudden death, sudden death is a problem which has to be taken into account. So here's one old lady. You see, this is a small colloid cyst. The foramen of Monroe is open, no hydrocephalus. I have observed her over 15 years and no, no growth. So if the cyst is very small, especially in elderly patients, usually they, they progress very slowly and many of them do not experience do not progress at all. So this is a good indication watch and scan makes no, no need to make any surgery for that. And it is not good because sometimes I see patients with a small cyst, then they go to the neurosurgeon and he wants to operate and then they say, oh, yes, a high risk sudden death can appear just to make the patient to give consent for the surgery. But I think this is not okay. But sudden death is a problem. Many years ago, I made a literature research because we had one sudden death. And what I found is the younger the patient, the shorter is the history. And there were some reports with a history less than 24 hours. Maybe the children did not complain about headache, but maybe it can develop very rapidly, especially in kids. And you see less than one day. And that is very, very important. So the period from onset of similar to death range from 25 years to a few hours. And we had two of these cases. One was a 19 year old girl, four months history of intermittent headaches. And suddenly she fell in coma, came to our unit and she was already brain death. And you see 
the large cysts. So if there is new headaches in young patients, especially with pressure feeling, with nausea, immediately an imaging should be done. That is very important. The second case was a 30 year old male. He had a five month history of headache. Then he had a car accident and came to our um, emergency department. And we said he should stay for observation. He said, no, no, I want to go. And because he had no obvious injuries, he, he left our uh, emergency unit. And then three hours later, he had a headache, vomiting, seizure, and rapid deterioration in consciousness. He came back to our, our hospital with emergency, with the ambulance, and you see the same image, hydrocephalus, complete occlusion of the frame of Monroe herniation and death. So that's why if I see patients with a, with a colloid cyst, and the ventricles are already dilated, I usually advise for surgery and I would not wait too long. Of course, if they are asymptomatic, you can discuss with them, but when there is the initial headache, immediately you should do something. Usually I, I, I talk to them, they should undergo surgery because there is a risk that they deteriorate. On the other hand, we had also this patient, you see here, cyst is filling the third ventricle, but a little bit of CSF is squeezing here between fornix and cyst, so no ventricular dilation. And then four years later, cyst is gone. So spontaneous rupture may occur, but of course you should not advise the patients to wait for that because it is a rare appearance. This is Michael Powell from England. He was the first who described an endoscopic approach to colloid cysts in 1983, but later on he became a pituitary surgeon. So when you look at the initial literature, you see that mainly it was a partial resection of a capsule coagulation. It was very rare that the total resection was performed. And the statement from Philip Deck, for example, was by its nature, endoscopy cannot offer complete removal as compared to microsurgical technique. And uh, Abdu and Cohen also stated total resection of cyst wall is usually not possible. But is this really true or not? This is an Italian study with 61 patients and they found in the endoscopic group that they had some uh, residuals and then they had seven asymptomatic recurrences. So if you leave tumor uh, tissue behind of the cyst wall, then you have to expect that there is a recurrence. What are the treatment options? Stereotactic aspiration was tried initially, but of course the hole is occluding very fast and so the recurrence rate is very high. Shunting is performed in, in many countries, but this in my opinion is not, not good, especially because you reduce the ventricular size and the access is more difficult. But microsurgical resection and endoscopic resection are both very successful techniques. And if you look at the literature, the results of the latest microsurgical series are really good. So why endoscopy then? You see, this was a patient from Cairo. It's a huge colloid cyst, hydrocephalus, vomiting. And then they put a shunt. And then when she came for surgery, all ventricles were gone. So the approach here is of course more difficult because you have no ventricular size. And the only option in this case is of course just to make a transcalosal approach, resect the cyst and remove the shunt. But you see here is an over drainage. All the ventricles are collapsed. So we make a small microsurgical transcalosal approach, remove the cyst and you see the ventricles come, come up to the normal size like it should be. So shunting in my opinion is not a good, it's not a good alternative to cyst resection. So we never do this. So the question is, is a safe endoscopic total cyst resection possible? Yes, but how should we avoid complications? And it's very important when you deal with a colloid cyst, you need a specialized equipment. You cannot do it with any endoscope you have, but it must be effective. What I like to do is I retract with the endoscopic troker. That's why for me, this endoscopic sheath, and with the endoscopic sheath, not with a troker, with the endoscopic sheath, that is for me very, very important. Accurate patient selection, I mentioned already. The entry point has to be selected 
to be at the proper place. I like to have by manual technique to see the pedicle. And I use a lot of sharp dissections so and not simply pulling because then you will rupture some veins and will bleed. Hemostasis is done with a small chamber irrigation technique or with a dry field technique. So what is the equipment what we use? We use a lot of endoscope because the diameter of this main working shingle is 2.9 millimeter. And this accepts a big suction tube of 2.7 millimeters. This is an endotracheal suction tube, which I use to evacuate the cysts, very important. And then here, the endoscopic sheath I use to retract the fornix in some cases, so that gives me access to the pedicle. And we have, of course, an irrigation channel inflow outflow, and we can use one of these irrigation channels for a second instrument. So I have a bimanual technique. So here's one bar example. You see here is the colloid cyst, and here is running the, is the fornix. And then I take my sheath, bring it in, and then I elevate the fornix a bit. And then I have full exposure of the cyst wall and can resect it. So for me, it's very important. I always go back with the endoscope into the sheath, have the small chamber, which gives some space, and then I can very safely work in the space. Large suction tube is very important, 2.7 millimeters, Chayet 8. If you have a small one, you cannot evacuate the cyst because frequently the content is really very mucous. It's not coming easily, sometimes even firm, and then it's difficult and you need um, forceps to resect it. And this we use for irrigation. It's just connected to one of the uh, irrigation channels. I like to have a pneumatic holding arm. I don't like it if a cistern is holding it because they move a little bit and this is pretty reliable. I think it's one of the best systems which are available on the market. You just press this golden button and then you can position it very precisely. HD camera, of course, it's of utmost importance. You see the quality of an HD camera connected to an endoscope. You see even the erythrocytes running through the blood vessels. So it gives you very good resolution and very good visualization of the lesion. Patient selection is very, very important. What is the size of the ventricles? It says an asymmetry of the ventricle, size of the frame of Monroe. What is the size of the colitis? What is the content of the colitis? So we look at the T2 weighted image. If it's really black, usually it's a very firm content. And of course, where is the cyst located? Is it more anteriorly located or more posteriorly? Is it more in the septum? Very important is, of course, the relation of the cyst to fornix and veins. So all these points have to be taken into account. Head position entry point. So we just place the patient that the entry point is mostly the highest point that we have not too much egress of CSF, that there is not so much air coming in. And then you see the, the uh, borehole. Initially, we tried here a borehole at the coronal suture, moved laterally and anteriorly. That is very important because the foramen of Monroe is a sagittal structure, so not an axial. It's more sagittal oriented. So if you come more from front, you have a better um, trajectory to the cyst. We usually, usually uh, use new navigation to approach the cyst to have really a precise um, approach trajectory, which was just slide over the head of the colloid nucleus. This is our setup. We have the MR images here. On one side, navigation images and the endoscopic images. So this was initially our approach when we started with endoscopy, but you see we have a tangential view to the colloid cyst. We look to the floor of a third ventricle, but not to the roof where the cyst is attached to. So this is wrong, should not be done. The approach should be far anteriorly and just sliding over the head of the colloid nucleus, because then you have the best view to the colloid cyst. The only exception is when we have a cavum in a septum pellucidum, then you can come on top of a cyst that means you go through one of the septum and you are exactly on top of a cyst and can resect it. And it's not required to come laterally, especially because these cysts usually push the fornix down. And then you have just a very small area where you can go to the cyst. So in this case, it's better. You open one layer of a septum above the fornix. And then you go in, you have one fornix on this side, one fornix on this side, and you can open here the tailor and can resect the cyst. So bimanual technique and sharp dissection is, in my opinion, very important. For the bimanual technique, we have a flexible 
grasping forceps. It must be flexible because here is an angle in this irrigation tube. And then the main instrument comes via the central main working channel. You can elevate this and you can cut, and there's no risk that you cut down to the fornix or the veins because you can elevate it. It's very important for the colloids because you can get control over the pedicle. You see, I dislocate the cyst into the lateral ventricle. This is a pedicle where the vessels from the telacoridia are coming. If you just pull more, you rupture all, this vent, uh, all these vessels. That's why I take a bipolar and I coagulate it. So I take the grasping forceps via the side channel, elevate the cyst, get access to the pedicle, come with my bipolar probe from the working main working channel, and then with scissors, and I can cut the pedicle with scissors. So this gives you a very safe technique. You avoid any hemorrhage because you have control over the pedicle, and then you can remove the cyst. Hemostasis is important because there are a lot of vessels. Usually we use the bipolar diathermy probe, sometimes the bipolar uh, forceps. One of our fellows coined our technique, the small chamber irrigation technique, because when we start operating and there's a bleeding, we stay there, don't move, you know, we initiate irradiation, uh, irrigation, and then we Close, slowly approach the bleeding point. And if you have a glimpse of it, we go back with the endoscope into the sheath and create a small chamber. And because this chamber is small, we can clear it with irrigation. And then I go very close with the margin of my sheath to the bleeding point. And then I can irrigate and have a good view. You can never irrigate so much that you get a clear view in the lateral ventricles because the volume is too large. It will always be bloody. But with this small chamber, you can get a good view. One example, colloid cyst. An artery is attached to the colloid cyst from the telechoridia. So it's a bimedial technique. I pull on the cyst to get access to the small artery. And then I really coagulated four times. So I thought this might be good that this vessel is occluded. And then I take this and I cut too far centrally. I should cut more close to the cyst. That was my mistake. And you see, it starts to bleed and it's a little bleeding. Microsurgically, you would not <clears throat> even recognize it because it's just a little bit oozing, but here it completely obscures, obscures the view because this is underwater surgery. So what we do now, we start with our irrigation to clear the view. And you have a glimpse of the anatomy. So I go back with my endoscope into the sheath. You see the margin of the sheath, and then I introduce it slowly into the lateral ventricle. And then you see, I go back into my sheath and have control. And now I have to elevate the fornix to come to the tailor because here's the origin of the artery. And then I coagulate this artery, and then I can, can continue with my, with my surgery. So it's very important that we look to vessels which are sticky to the cyst because you might injure them very, very easily. So this was a small chamber irrigation technique. Sometimes you have severe hemorrhage and this is not working. So the dry field technique is another technique. And it indicated when we cannot control the hemorrhage with a small chamber irrigation technique with short time of irrigation. We published this at first in 2002 in our first series of college cyst resection. And then Joachim Oertl from Hamburg put six cases together where we use this technique. You see, this is the same patient what I showed you before. There was a miscommunication between me and my assistant. He should rotate the, the thing as a the sheath, but not pulling. And then you see the Japanese flag is coming. Everything is red. That was pretty clear that irrigation will not work in this way. So we put our suction tube in, and then we aspirated the bloody CSF. And it's interesting, in all these cases where I did it in colitis, the bleeding stopped spontaneously. So I did not need to coagulate anything. Just by removing the CSF, the bleeding stopped. And then usually I refill the place with water because the ventricles are collapsing. And then I continue with my surgery.
we see after this no damage to the fornix, no damage to the vein, and we could proceed with our surgery. So I want to show you some cases. At first, an easy one. You see here, young boy, unilateral dilation of the left ventricle, is cyst, is not black, is bright in the MRI T2 weighted images. So that's a good sign that the color content might be okay. Navigation guided, of course. We go laterally, just sliding over the head of the, nu uh, head of the colloid nucleus, and we see a nice cyst, not covered with any plexus, apparent, very easy. We cut with scissors, open it, and you see very nice content because of the suction tube, seven seconds empty. And then irrigation, you see the cyst almost surrenders spontaneously, comes out, very thin cyst wall. Then I coagulated a little bit uh, called plexus, maybe even not needed in this case. And then I grasped the cyst with the small grasping forcer from the side channel. Then with the main channel, I elevate more. And then in this case, there was even not, not a vessel. So this is an ideal case, of course, for this, but you never know how is the situation. You only see it when you go in. And here, this is just a fibrous band. I could also take scissors now to cut it, but it looks not very dangerous. So I just removed the cyst and that's it. So that is a straightforward case, easy one. And you see reduction of the size of ventricles and it is more than 12 years now, no recurrence so far. It's another case, small colloid cyst. On the right side, trick a little bit larger. But you see what you see here when you look, there is the vein. You see here, this is the vein on the uh, um, running very close to the frame and Monroe. Here you see it, salomostriate vein comes in, very thick one. But because the ventricle here is wider, we come from the right side, not from the left side, because there's also a vein and the space is limited. So because of the dilation, we come from the right side. Here again, you see it seems to be the better trajectory. Also, when you look here at the foramen, size of the foramen in the sagittal plane, this should be the ideal trajectory. And here we see this is a very thick thermostride way called plexus and it's just one millimeter or 1.5, which is remaining. So first we coagulate the core plexus. Then we open the cyst with scissors, you see. Then the suction tube is coming. And again, the colloid content is suckable. But we have to be very careful because the fornix is running here. So irrigation and mobilization of the cyst wall, bring it into the lateral ventricle. Now we have to dislocate the cyst into the lateral ventricle, but it's very important that we just grasp the cyst wall. You see, you see again a vessel here, supplying vessel, but it's very important that you just grasp the cyst wall, not the telechoridia. That is very important. And then here I can elevate the cyst, I can take my bipolar, co coagulate this vessel, take scissors, cut it, and then the whole thing can be removed. So even though the space was very limited because the content looks promising, I made the decision to make an endoscopic approach for this cyst. And the last case I want to show here, there's a cyst symmetrically, then usually we come from the right side. So the cyst looks a little bit darker this is the approach just over the head of the coiled nucleus. Here, this is apparent in the foramen. So we coagulate the coil plexus. Then we cut into the cyst with scissors. Then again, the suction tube comes. So it's not so easily suckable. The initial content was okay, but there was more. 
firm content. So then again, we have to mobilize the cyst into the lateral ventricles. You see, all the coral plexus is attached to the cyst. Must be very careful. Again, the suction tube is used. And here's a very firm content, which is not suckable. So I grasp it. And here you see, again, I, you have to grasp just the cyst wall, not the tailor. And usually there is a plane between these. Here I want to coagulate some vessels from the tailor choroidea. I take my endoscopic sheath to elevate the cyst to get better access to the vessels which are down here. So I coagulate, and then I cut. But you see there's one vessel which I missed and again it starts to bleed. And that is of course what we don't want because we have no control where you are. And in this case, it, initially we tried with um, irrigation coagulation, but then I switched over to the dry field technique. And you see again, after sucking off the bloody CSF, bleeding stopped. And then again, I bring the cyst in the right plane out. Yeah, I have refill it because the bipolar is working only underwater and also because the ventricle is collapsing. You see the pedicle here with a lot of vessels. And now I can push the cyst up in front of the fornix because the pedicle is long in this case. And then you see under direct visualization, very precise, I can cut all these coral plexus, which has nothing to do. Then the cyst is not fitting even through the endoscopic sheath, so I have to remove the whole system through the cortical puncture channel, and then the cyst comes out. And this is a 45 degree endoscope for inspection. It's a contralateral fornix, it's intact. This is a telechoridia, so there's no cyst remnant, just the vessels at the tela, and the fornix looks good. So even if it's difficult, you can deal with it. Should you always aim for total resection? This is a, um, a huge, the largest choroid cyst what I have seen in my life. There was a patient from Kuwait and the fornix was stressed like paper, was really stretched like paper around the cyst. So in this case, we made a large septostomy, then we removed all the content and then I make on the other side also a large septostomy. And then we left it open, especially the fornix we left alone because even with microsurgery, I was afraid that we damage it, it was so stretched. And you see the fornix here, in the post-op, this is a follow-up, I think after two years, then he moved to another state, so I could not see him again, but he improved markedly in his memory problems, markedly. So I think in this case, it was the right decision. Should you always go endoscopically? This was a patient you see here, colloid cyst, you think from left side, it should be approachable. This lady had already surgery at another, department, they said it was not possible to resect it. And then I said, that's, that's surprising. When you look here, we make a cyst, it looks so nice. Fornix seems to be here. This is a cyst, should be easy. I talked to her, we tried with an endoscope, but if there's really a reason because why the first surgeon did not continue, we have to switch to microsurgery. And when we looked in, you see there is the cyst completely covered by the fornix. It's a very thin stretched fornix over cyst, this was the area where the ventricular catheter was inserted, but this is all fornix. This is all fornix from here to here. So in this case, I said, when we, of course we could open here endoscopically, but I said, it's too much manipulation. So I switched to a tube and make a microsurgical resection. We open here the septum and I took the cyst from above. So I did not touch this very thin fornix tissue. She had some memory problems, issues, but that resolved after, after in the follow-up in one year. Another patient, you see a very black cyst indicating firm content, and you see the vein here and here. So it seems to be that the frame is very thin. This is all septum and fornix. So uh, to this patient, I also told, this is a case for microsurgery, but we look first with the endoscope, and if it confirms what we expect, then we continue with the tube. And you see, this is a cyst, this is a fornix frame and is almost occluded. And then we switch to this Weiger tube. Now, of course, you could also with an endoscope open it, but I think for the fornix, the manipulation is more delicate if you have bimanual 
dissection with traction counter traction. So this was an interphony seal approach because there was a small cavum, one fornix, the other fornix, and you see the content is very firm. And this would really, really be a struggle with the endoscope. And here you see, I can grasp the cyst. With the other hand, I can dissect the tissue around it. This is internal cerebral veins coming. And you see here, this is a cyst wall. This other stuff is all telechoroidia, has nothing to do with the cyst. So we cut the core plexus, which was attached to it. Then we cut the tela, and the cyst is removed. And you see here, this is an interphony seal approach. Here are the veins. And this guy had no memory problems after surgery. You see the phonics looks very good. And the last case, you see there's huge ventricles, phonicis. There is no, um, there is no uh, space in between the phonicis. So initially I thought I come from above because the foramen here also is very small, but the cyst content you see mostly is very, um, very soft and here is a hard component. So I looked with an endoscope and you see, it's not a good idea to open it here in the midline. So we go to the foramen, it's very narrow, it's just one millimeter. See, it's less than one millimeter. So then I made the decision, I come with a tube. So I replaced the endoscope with a tube, it says 12 millimeters at the tip, but allows you a bimanual dissection. And you see, I can enlarge the foramen a little bit with my forceps. Then I open the cyst and I am lucky because you see the content is very, very liquid. The suction comes easily out. And then I take forceps, and again, you should grasp just the, the cyst, not the tailor. And then frequently there is a good plane and the cyst comes out very easy. Not always, of course, but most of the time you see if you have the right, the right plane, and again, here's the pedicle. So we take care of the pedicle, coagulation, and then we cut it with scissors. So not simple pulling. The pulling is always not good because this usually results in hemorrhage and then all the blood is in the ventricle. It's not good. So I never put any um, external drain after these surgeries. I just inspect with an endoscope. Is there anything in front of the aqueduct? Is the foramen free? See, foramen looks good. This is the optic chiasm in fundibular recess. And then we look into the back to the aqueduct. There is no no tissue. Then we remove, remove it, and I close the cortical incision with fibrin glue to avoid subdural collection of CSF. And this is a result after surgery. We also had a small cyst. You see, this patient comes with this cyst, and I said, "No, go home. This is not symptomatic." And then he comes back after half a year, after one year, always complaining of headache, sometimes nausea, and he was really he. Somebody made him crazy about sudden death. And then I said, okay, let's go. What approach we can do? It's just transcalosal, microsurgical approach. And, and we removed the cysts. I don't show you the video. We run out of time, but you see we removed it. And then I asked him, and how are you? And he said, the pressure feeling is gone, but still I have, have a little bit of headache. So I think this was not indicated, this is too small. So we had our first series published uh, some years ago and we had three patients with small remnants and two of the three developed a recurrence. None of them is operated so far because they still have no ventricular dilation, but it shows if you leave something, it can be a problem. And um, in 2020, we published this paper in JNS about the bimanual sharp dissection technique and there were 16 patients and one was asymptomatic. We had four venous hemorrhages, which controlled with a dry field technique. One patient has complained about memory deficit wasn't, but I think she had an other disease additionally to the colloid cyst, obviously. 
And we had no mortality, relief of symptoms. This worsening of Chang, I think this is a natural cause of an, a, a, um, a dementia in this patient. We had total resection in almost all patients. One patient was an old patient. She requested that we make the most safe this surgery, and it was a small cyst. So we just uh, opened the cyst and left a small piece which was attached to the roof, but by intention. And we had not to change to microsurgery, and we have no recurrence in the series. So my conclusion is that in most colloid cysts, endoscopic rem removal is possible, even a total resection. If there is a micro piece which is attached to the tailor, I think that it should be safe to just coagulate it. But if you have to leave a lot of a capsule, then I would switch to microsurgery because we, sh we should avoid recurrences if possible. So thank you for your attention. I would like to invite you to become a member of the International Federation, International Federation of Neuroendoscopy. We, we become now more active because the pandemic is gone, at least for a while. There's an endoscopy course in Naples and Italy from July 18 to 22. So I invite everybody to join us there. And then of course, our main World Congress is in Singapore this year in November, 2019 to 22. So welcome everybody and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Schroeder. This was fascinating as always. Um, I'm really glad actually I've seen the small chamber technique because I've always wanted to see it and I hadn't managed to see it yet. And to mm. see you doing it in, uh, in, um, um, on the video is, is just absolutely great. I, I'm just wondering with the, with the suction and the wash, if I may ask, I don't think we've got any questions yet, but guys, by all means, either put them on the chat or the Q and A uh part of the uh, of the talk but if i may ask do you use high pressure wash because i tend to as well and the suction do you ever connect it to the wall because i i tend to now connect it just mount it as the same in the same way as i do for the uh, microscopic surgery but you have to be careful of course that someone's around so they can stop it directly if you've got anything sucked into the sucker yeah we do no we use it with a syringe to have a better control Yes, uh, absolutely. Okay. Because when you when you come to close and you don't see and you suck the blood and then you are out with your sucker on the phonics, then the phonics goes to the suction. So I would be careful. I would be very slow and I take the syringe better. There's a graduated one that I've managed to get my whole my, my hands on. I think it was from Oscala. So okay. you can basically graduate it in the same way. So when you've got it inside, even if it's on 50%, uh, 70%, or even 100%, suction it doesn't suck everything up as soon as you start covering the thumb piece then it starts acting in the same way but obviously yes absolutely as you say great care to be uh, to be exercised yeah. there and it must be long because it should go down it is. yes it's a very oh, no. so we, i was using ng tubes before it's great to see what you're using because it's far better than anything i tried before i kept trying all these flexible tubes and i found i had to use biopsy forceps to hold the tube inside to suck and i thought i can't really do an operation that way yeah and i use the invent i think now we're not we're not allowed to use the lotter because of the whole stores issue i hope they fix it very soon yes i'm sure it's very close to your heart anyway the lotter and little lotter i don't think it's any news to anyone who's logged in i mean you develop them um but with the invent i found the channel is bigger so i can hold a, a flexible tube inside but then uh, oscillap fixed the, the problem by just coming up with very long suction tubing, either sharp or blunt, and you can graduate it at the tip. So therefore you can actually just uh, link it to the wall. That, that, that changed things quite a bit. And I started using the soaring, which I know now you've also helped them develop the new tip so that it can fit down the lotter and the invent, which helps a lot. But I've not found it useful for colloid cysts. I don't know what your experience of the soaring is with colloid cysts. Well, I, haven't, I haven't used it for colloid cysts, no. Oh, no, exactly. And I, I, the transcoroid approach endoscopic in terms of maybe, you know, so I, we've done that for some of the pineals before to buzz the anterior septal vein and open the sept and open the choroid fissure in a similar way as we do with the microscopic approach sometimes. Yes. Um, I found that gave me more access. So instead of going more anterior and lateral, I still went with a 30 degree scope, a little bit more like I would do with an ETV, but then open the fissure and it gave more access to some of them. Do you, do you think that might be an option for the future to, yeah. to if, reduce yeah, the yeah. If, there, if the cyst is pushing the phonics away, yeah, it opens the space a little bit, then I would also do it. I did it already. But if I see that this cyst does not 
separate the fornix much from the from the thalamus. Then, in my opinion, it's more atraumatic for the fornix when you have both hands free and you dissect with forceps and you can cover the fornix with a patty or so. I think it's less atraumatic. It's less traumatic. I have seen uh, a video, some videos where also it was shown the pure endoscopic transcoroidal approach and the fornix did not look good in my opinion. So I'm, uh, if there is some space already created by the cyst because it separates the fornix and you have just some um, connective tissue which you can cut and open it in that way, it's good. But you know, sometimes immediately a vein, a septal vein comes from uh, um, going together with the salomus dry to the internal cerebral veins and then there's not much space. And then I think it's more risky with an endoscope because the fine traction counter traction technique is not possible with the, with this um, shaft ventriculoscope. Maybe with robotics in the future, we'll be able to do even Maybe when we have nano robots, yes. Yeah. So we've had some, uh, we've got uh, Khalid Ashour, who says, how do you explain the stoppage of bleeding when evacuation of the CSF? Doesn't this make negative pressure that increases the bleeding? Uh, so that's, no. uh, yeah. I think, I think when you remove the CSF, I think the CSF is, is, is keeping the bleeding active. If you remove the CSF and the tissue come together, then it just stopped the same. And when you put surgery cell on it, it just stops because there is not the washing of the blood from the, from the water. You know, it tries to coagulate and always the water comes and sh and pushes the clot away. And then when you put, when you remove the CSF, it just collapse, the tissue come together and it can coagulate spontaneously. And it's, it's odd. I've, I've been asked that question before when I mentioned dry field maneuver and uh, people always say, oh, no, no, well, that's dangerous. You should never be doing this. And then you say to them, well, when you do microscopic surgery, what's the first thing you do? And it's, you suck the CSF. Sure. So you never have that problem when you do it microscopically, but I think it's people are not used to the concept of doing it endoscopically. If you do it very quickly, you can cause, yes, especially in children, major problems if they got big ventricles with subdurals and so on. But if you do it relatively slowly, I think we should be okay. We've got another question that says blocking drainage for a while increases ICP and stops bleeding for a while. Such maneuver a couple of times stops bleeding. I'm not sure what is meant by that, uh, but I, I, I presume that means if we just leave all the wash inside and then the clot will form. But the only issue with that is then you go into a red uh, environment and you can't see very clearly. I, yes. I, I presume that's what they mean. Yeah, but then when, when, you, when you put the pressure at the highest point of the lotter, for example, then you have a pressure of, let's say, 15 centimeters water. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that will stop the bleeding. And in the cases I have shown, it will bleed more and more and more and make a tamponade of the ventricle. So that I don't want. That's why if there's a bleeding, immediately I try to suck off the blood and get the ventricles clear. So in these cases, I have never put a lumbar drain, uh, uh, a ventricular drain after surgery. Never. And that was one of the questions, actually, one of the, in the chat. It said, "Would you leave an EVD?" And you've already addressed it before. And I think yeah. it's very, it's very rare. Normally, you go in and you're very happy with the clearance of the. I think the only time I left an EVD is a patient was dying on the table, um, yeah. because she crashed, as you mentioned, this sudden death where she had headaches for a while. A young patient, and then I went in and and, and had to abandon very quickly. I did a septum pellucidotomy. I looked at the cyst and I I thought, right, I can take it out. And, you know, everything went off cardiovascularly. She was literally about to die. So I left an external ventricular drain and went back in 10 days later. And I think you don't tend to leave drains at all. Yes, I don't, I don't leave it. So I hope that answers that question. I think there are two more. And hopefully we can then move on and, and hear from Professor Zohidi. So uh, one, well, in the same uh, breadth of, of, of the question of the EVD, would you leave an access device as standard in all cases? No, never. Uh, I tend to, uh, you, you don't, I don't think. Is that right? No. no. Okay. Um, even, in ETVs, even in ETVs, usually we don't put it. When we have a case, for example, with shunt dependency and we are not sure whether this will work or not, sometimes we leave it, sometimes then we can connect a shunt easily when the yeah. chant is required. Um, and then the question, uh, the two questions here is uh, one which says for doing septostomy anterior to foramen of Monroe for small foramen, how to evaluate the safe margin of septostomy from fornix? 
I think that's kind of slightly different to uh, maybe the, the colloid cyst, but of course, if Professor wants to answer that, then by all means. I think it's if there's a very small frame and maybe and a big fornix and you're doing a septostomy, how to evaluate the safe margin. I, I, I presume it's a combination of things. Yeah, but you see it, usually you see it, especially if the foramen is small, you can differentiate the fornix very well. In the end, you go just above. Yeah. Just above. Um, and I think we've got, uh, does the CCRS play a role in your decision-making process? I'd love to, maybe you know what the CCRS is. I'm CC? at a loss. What CCRS, Beaumont 2016. I think, Christopher, you might have to uh, enlighten all of us. It may be that it's very obvious and we're missing it. But whilst you do that, I think the last one that I've got here is any advice in endoscopic dissection to access the pedicle, anti-clock or so on. Also in chronic arrested hydrocephalus, distorted thin fornix, or even in regular colloid, you prefer to do ETV or not? Also, Never. do you prefer new, uh, normal saline or ringer in wash? A lot of questions. I think the one that's really relevant here is whether you do an ETV in colloids or not, but I think Professor Zohdi may, may, may be covering some of that. Yeah, so I, I don't wanna- my, my opinion is that's not necessary especially in the cyst, which are just blocking the foramen of one row. They do not block the aqueduct. So even if they're recurrence, they will appear in the foramen. So the frame of one row is a problem, not the aqueduct. So that's why I think ETV is not useful. If you have a colloid cyst, which is in the posterior part of the third ventricle and is obstructing the outflow of the CSF to the aqueduct, of course, then ETV would might be useful, but in none of my cases, it was necessary so far, in none of my surgical cases. I think uh, some of the arguments, I, I'm sure, Mansoor, you're interjecting because I need to hurry this on. No, I no, 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 I, I think this is fantastic. I, I just wanted to mention about the CCRS. I think they were referring yes, to the- we've got it now. This this risk yes, yeah, yeah, sorry, but fantastic. Wonderful, please continue. Um, yeah, so in that case, uh, I, I think, that might answer the question of does the CCRS play a role in the decision-making process? I think Professor Schroeder, Professor Zuhdi will tell us as well. I, I wasn't, I've got to say, hands up, I wasn't really aware of the CCRS. I don't know if you guys normally I, go by the CCRS in decision-making. I did not get it. What is CCRS? It's a colloid cyst risk score, which was devised by Beaumont in 2016. I, I, I hadn't normally gone by that. I go by my instinct and in looking at the scan as to whether I can take it out or not. Exactly. That is what I do too. So I don't know about the score. I have to read it. It's interesting. Uh, I think it, um, it, it includes things like the age and whether the patient's got headache and the usual instinctive stuff, such as the diameter of the cyst and what it looks like on the, uh, on the scan. So it's, I, I think, to be frank, it's, it's using all the stuff that uh, you know, Henry and Ahmad and, uh, and, and yourself use instinctively a quick question, if I may just please put to the panel to think about later, is what is the critical size if there was anything? Because um, from previous times, when I looked into this, it was anything over than eight millimeter. Nothing smaller than eight millimeters that would cause sudden death, but it's something to think about or discuss maybe later, um, if that's okay. That might be maybe when uh, when Professor Zohdi uh, uh, gives his talk, we can we can cover that because I have a feeling he's going to cover a lot of those questions. And with Sounds regard like to the ETV, we'll be we'll be also covering that a, a little bit later. But I think some of the things and the people normally bring arguments along of when you look at the MRI, sometimes the aqueduct looks like it's closed, maybe because there's hydrocephalus fluid is not going to the third, it's not keeping the aqueduct open. That's one of the arguments. But I guess that's a case by case. But I think most people don't think, I think if you don't do a lot of endoscopy, you say, oh, ETV for a colloid cyst. And it's not an ETV for a colloid cyst. It's an endoscopy to take a colloid cyst out. And generally speaking, the ETV is a different um, story altogether. So I think um, a lot of people who would like to do observerships, you're all, I'm sure, very welcome all over. Mm -hmm. I think the EANS and all these kind of uh, um, uh, societies and, and bodies encourage that. I think certainly we live in a global age. Of course, hopefully we won't have another pandemic or anything like that, and you're all welcome to visit. So without further ado, I think we introduced Professor Zohdi already, and he's been very patient and I'm sure very keen to share his wealth of expertise. So if I may pass the, 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 the mantle to you, uh, Professor Zohdi, welcome and thank you very much.
Thank you for your kind invitation. I mean, it's uh, to me, it is an enjoyable issue to meet Henry and Mansoor, and of course you, Basil, now. So it's, uh, let's go for it and let us see. Okay. We were asked to, to discuss neuroendoscopic surgery for colloid cysts. This is just very quickly where I come from, Cairo University uh, School of Medicine. Uh, these are the dean's office built in 32, 19, of course, and these are the new buildings. And originally the faculty was started back in 1827. So we are very soon going to celebrate two, day, two centuries. It's about, with the affiliated hospital, about 6,000 beds. When I go back to, to whatever I do as endoscopy, et cetera, and I have done in the past three decades, the, 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 what we are going to talk about now are the excision biopsy, the foraminoplasty, and ETV. All three of them, of course, not everybody agrees about the last thing, ETV, but I still have to uh, underline and underscore and, and, and highlight the fact that you might be needing to do an ETV and not let this, let me talk about it later. Okay, current neuroendoscopic procedure. Endoscopy in general is a versatile technique. When it comes to colloid cysts, these are the type of things that you might need to do. A foraminoplasty to reach the colloid cyst, and then you excise and you take a biopsy, and then thereafter you might have to do an ETV. Uh, our prime purpose in this life is to help others. And if you can't help them, at least don't hurt them. Dalai Lama, very important data. Now, standalone procedure. This is endoscopic assisted, endoscopic control with microsurgery. It's a pendulum versus a stary uh, decisis. I believe that the illiterate, this dictum of Alvin Toffler is, is great. The illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn, unlearn, and relearn. You should persevere, hope for the best but you should be flexible enough to convert back to the microsurgery and plan for the worst. Colloid cysts, I, I guess everybody knows uh, all these uh, facts, uh, less than 1% of intracranial tumors. Colloid cyst is an intracranial tumor, by the way. Uh, epithelium lined with the contents mucin, this is gelatinous. Uh, it originates from the telechoroid, and this is a very important anatomical uh, information that we have to bear in mind. And uh, it, the, the most common site is the anterior third ventricle. We do not disagree. It might be tucked up into the septum uh, pellucidum, which is, which is a synonym fifth ventricle and the sixth ventricle, which is the Kevin uh, Vergi, Kevin septum Vergi. Very rarely so in the posterior third or the fourth ventricle, cerebellum frontal or pivot. The usual sizes that we are facing are from half a centimeter to four centimeter. Just quickly, what Henry has mentioned uh, just a couple of minutes ago, the site of the colloid cyst and that it is an anterior one and not a posterior one and hence it will not uh, close the, uh, the uh, aqueduct. I do ETV because I dread the spillage. Not that I am afraid I left something. Uh, I dread the spillage because it's a very irritant material and it can actually close complete edema in and around the aqueduct and actual blockage of the aqueduct with an event which nobody would, would like to think about, this acute hydrocephalus and even death. You do your surgery, you do your ATV, you have a good night's sleep and see the patient on the next day to test his memory. This is my concept. Now, these are typically the anatomy or what we have studied very much so 
uh, of the velum interpositum, which is the origin of the colloid cyst. Uh, in a sequential descriptive anatomical study, we did describe the velum interpositum, uh, triangular potential space, two layers of telacoroid in the roof of the third ventricle, the upper surface and the lower surface as indicated. This is very important. Why? Again, the potential midline spaces or midline cysts or midline cisterns, cavum septum pellucidum, fifth ventricle, cavum septum virgi, sixth ventricle, cavum venum interpositum, the real origin of the uh, uh, colloid cyst. And now this is a question I never been answered and, and I myself don't know uh, the answer for that. Where is it that it really arises from? And it arises here, more mostly in the anterior part of the velum interpositum. Or in the, now, is it arising from the upper surface or the lower surface? Nobody knows. I don't think anybody knows. So when it arises from here, this is the natural extension. It arises from the infolding neuroepithelium of the telacroidy, and this is where it extends to, to the anterior part of the third ventricle, blocking the foramen of the neuro. Still, it can arise from here, or the, from the upper layer now, and push itself anteriorly uh, and superiorly into the cavum septum pellucidum and being tucked up and causes this uh, closure of the foramen of monolo. This is another way of uh, extension. Uh, going up and down, and this would be a transgressing uh, colloid cyst going into the cavum uh, virgi and into uh, and from the uh, um, velum downwards into the uh, third ventricle. These are very quickly the cavum, which is not part of our, but it gives you an idea where it originally, where it originally originates. This is the velum assist, and this is cavum both septum elucidum and cavum virgi. I have never seen a solidly uh, cavum uh, virgi. This is just to sum up, uh, the main presenting decades are the fourth to the seventh. The youngest we had was a female, 14 years, although the Richard, the youngest ever, was two months. Um, the symptoms and asymptomatic, sort of incidental finding, are the most common thing that you find with colloid cysts. And when you tell the patient you have a colloid cyst, he starts having his headaches. And this is another issue uh, to be discussed. With all the other options, the still the level of consciousness, sudden death, in some series up to 20. Thank God we didn't have any of those. Uh, the symptoms increase, what we found from our series, increase, increases with young age, the size, ventricular megaly, and the contents. We have reported recently, back uh, last month, uh, the strategy of working in and around the foramen of Monroe. And we definitely emphasize that this part of the foramen of Monroe is the safest part, although there is the choroid plexus and just behind it would be the venous angle, very dangerous, I fully agree. But still, it is safer to work through here than to go here, here, or even here to the thalamus. Back to the to the variables or to the the real contributors to of the whether to operate or not is it the site, the size, the contents, the capsule, the ventricular megaly? Should we wait and see? Should we try uh, stereotactic aspiration, resection? Everything is on the table. Now again to show you site, size, contents, capsule. See how. This, this one is a tucked up one. This is 
anterior third ventricle. And this is a transgressing one, passing through the venum interpositum into the third ventricle and up into the uh, lateral ventricles. Now, this is a kind of colloid cyst, definitely less than a centimeter. I wouldn't say half, it is more of a six, seven millimeter. Would you operate or not? We need to discuss. The site again, and the size and the ventricular megaly. Okay, this is, as we said, the tucked up. And the size is not that big, one and a half, 1.4 millimeter. Yet it is causing an immense hydrocephalus and acute one. So this is definitely for surgery. How about this one? A small colloid cyst, as you see, even not closing the foramen of Mondo. But this on and off closure is also very dangerous and it's causing hydrocephalic changes. Now look at this one, the small one, and no ventricular megaly, while not very much bigger with acute hydrocephalus. And here a very small one and still acute hydrocephalus. So the decision, I fully agree with Henry, would be to find first the colloid cyst. And when you find it, does the patient complain or not uh, on an off headache? Then let us go and see what we are going to do uh, and what kind of search and explain that to the patient. Variables affecting strategy. This is what we really depend on, whether we're going to do a solely endoscopic surgery or endoscopic assisted by manual. When I do endoscopic uh, surgery, I definitely do not depend on my uh, assistant. I, the holding system is, is a must to be able to really use both hands. I know most of the endoscopes do not have two channels, but you can all actually adapt. You can push a two or three Fogarty to the irrigation and not close it even or not and leave it uh, patent. And from the working channel, you use your instruments, possible. And now the port of entry to do ETV, to do EVD, radicality versus safety, the minimal invasive neurosurgical concept, the tailored approach. So this is what we do. We depend on this cochlear the hole very much. We go now anterior. If we find after inspecting that we need to go anterior or posterior, if we need to go posterior. As I said, we consider cochlear bell hole a keyhole so for, the, for most of the third ventricular tumors and of course the uh, colloid cyst. And we added a third and a different uh, site of craniotomy, mini craniotomy. It's, these are all some like or some size mini craniotomies. You either go anterior or you go posterior, or you even go midway, anterior and posterior. You have the choice, and you decide on table what you're going to do. Now, all the uh, maneuvers that you, and all the tricks that we use are here, actually, in this case. Aspiration of the content, or piecemeal removal accordingly, combined balloon squeeze. We use the balloon, the Fogarty balloon, to squeeze at the edge. I will show it now in the video. At the edge of the, uh, uh, between the fornix or deeper down than the fornix and the cyst, so that you squeeze out the contents. Whether you, we consider that what we are doing here to, this, to the foramen of Monroe, is the type of excisional foraminoplasty in contrast to restoration foraminoplasty or uh, dilatation foraminoplasty. Uh, and we do septostomy if needed, and we coagulate the cyst capsule. We combat bleeding as mentioned by Henry and the CSF diversion, we stress upon that. We are believers of, the, of that. 
And again, because we dread the spillage. The spillage is a disaster. And you cannot actually prevent it. And once you, you irrigate an ample irrigation, this is what I meant with the balloon growing anterior and squeezing the contents out instead of depending mainly on suction and you could suck the wall or the capsule with it and cause injury. But this way, and then of course, we do this. Marvelous results, very satisfactory. Floor ready for ETV. Why? As long as I'm there, why not do it and do the ETV? We differ in that, but I mean, in order to find a, an interesting debate thereafter. And now let me show you the variant possibilities of the colloid cyst. It could be coapted, the foramen of the row, displayed, huge, placentic, part of the foramen open, a large foramen of monorail, a divericated foramen of monorail with the anterior septal in between, a dilated, a recurrent, an adherent with spillage somehow, with bleeding, and this is what it looks like. We stopped doing it solidly uh, endoscopically. So take this huge one in a medical student in his final year, and he's complaining of recall memory. This has to be done perfectly, and you have to remove the colloid cyst and give him a chance. Uh, actually, it was done through a left approach, wider ventricle, and fortunately, we were successful, and he's a fellow colleague now. Of course, not in neurosurgery, but I mean, he passed his final exams. This is a kind of tuck tuck, which uh, actually uh, uh, endoscopic uh, surgery alone sufficed. This is an interesting adherent without previous surgery. And this is again a recurrent case. Done in endoscopic assisted. This is pre and post ETV in colloid cyst. This one, uh, this one was the adherent case with the signs of some sort of inflammatory lesion at the site of ETV. ETV done with visual, visual confirmation. And this is another case again with visual visual confirmation. Now, if you are an MIN concept deleter, and you go in and you find that this is through the burr hole, the copper burr hole, this is what you find as a colloid cyst. It's just not an easy one to remove endoscopically. You can, you can anticipate a lot of bleeding. So you just extend your burr hole, as previously mentioned, and after the put an EVD, if you did not do an ETV, and this is the mini craniotomy, thumb size, and this is another control and a control MRI. Post-operative complications of colloid cysts. All you see, everybody is showing you here is the colloid cyst, colloid cyst, colloid cyst, and here is the post-operative. Does anybody show you that? What we call silent complications, minimally inclusive operating port and corridor. But nevertheless, this can develop into a poronkephalic cyst 
and even the recording catalytic system under tension. And mind you, okay, let's call it minimal invasive, but it is still a wide corridor. Post operative complications, meningitis, chemical spillage. This is all what always I raise a flag in that sense chemical meningitis, transient ongoing recall memory disturbance. You come back to the patient next day. Uh, do you know me? Ah, yes, you are Dr. Zodi. Uh, this is not the correct test. You should tell him after the surgery a, sh a short story and go ask him to, 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 to recall it on the second or third day. And then you rest assured, okay, I've done my job well. The intraoperative bleeding, the cerebrospinal fluid leak. We do a subgallial pocket, we do some drainage in all but to avoid uh, as much as possible a continuous BP uh, uh, shunt for any reason. The recurrence, as Bardo has, has also shown by uh, uh, Henry, uh, it changes the content. The contents are changed. And actually, whatever you have done with cytostomy and ETV, would suffice for the patient and he lives happily thereafter. I have cases with more than eight years or nine years follow up with such an MRI, previously a beautiful MRI without anything. And then they start to show that on the third or fourth year. And then they remain as such, <clears throat> sorry, with no, no actual problems. It is, after all, a set of minds, the knowledge, a set of skill, the learning curve, and a set of tools, your endoscopic equipment. Now, take home message, prepare yourself for a tedious learning curve, focus on command of morbid anatomy, and anticipate anatomical variations, expect limitations, do's and don'ts, doable or not, convey and share valuable knowledge with your colleagues. Patient safety comes first. Plan your surgery and hope for the best. Thank you. Professor Zohdi, thank you very, very much. I think that message uh, is, is very much uh, driven home uh, by you describing a colleague who, well, now a colleague, but a, a previous medical student. I think one of the most important things is for us to always put ourselves in the patient's shoes and just say, what would we want to have done? And I think if you're someone who endoscopically can achieve it and you have the tools and you're confident in your work and it's the right patient for that, then absolutely that's the way to go. If you're someone who thinks actually with this, I can perhaps achieve the same, if not even better outcomes by doing it microscopically or with a tubular retractor than the same. But I think that the two scans that you showed, thank you very much for showing those because yes, all of us are sometimes guilty of showing the best looking scans and the best outcomes. But I think something that Henry Marsh has always stressed over and over and over again. I, I remember him standing up at a, an, an American conference somewhere where everyone else was talking about the great results that they had. And he stood up and talked about all his disasters, uh, which was a complete contrast. And I think it's important that we look at that because everyone will have these complications. Every, everyone will have problems. Otherwise, you're either not operating enough or you're just not really opening your eyes to see them. And it's important that we all do that. So thank you very, very much for, for, for that nice little twist on colloysis. And it's been a pleasure to hear your talk uh, after Professor Schroeder's talk. And can I just ask if anyone else has got any questions at the moment or any other comments in the chat? Um, just let me have a quick look and see. At the moment, I think we've closed all the questions and we've got the chat, which is looking uh, pretty much up to date. We had just a comment from Bassam Dabu saying he loves the slide that gathers the variance that you had encountered. And he said it might be an idea to enlarge the video and play it to maximize everyone's learning. I think it was very clear, but perhaps we can share it in some in some way after the um, uh, after the conference um, and 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 help everyone else in terms of it was beautifully summarized. Um, so yes, hopefully we can share that afterwards. Professor Schroeder, any comments uh, on on Professor Zohdi's uh, talk? <laughs> I have always the same comments. <laughs> this I agree with him in most of these aspects. The only thing is the ETV. 
But it's interesting, his cases have a thin floor. In most of my cases, when we have young people in a college cysts, there is a slit third ventricle because there's no drainage. And then the floor is very thick. So I think this is healthy tissue, which I would not, not puncture. I had not good feeling to puncture it because in my opinion, it's not needed. And so far I had never problem because I did not do an ETV in all of our, in all of our cases. And secondly, there might be a problem with uh, the hypothalamus or with the, the eye when you have a thick floor. So I would be very reluctant to do it. That is the only discrepancy to the Cairo style of college surgery. <laughs> but it may be a patient selection. Is that right, uh, Professor Zohedi? Because it, yes, it looks it like is. yours were slightly different. It is, it is the patient's selection actually during surgery. You cannot predict how stretched the floor would be when it is planet beak like and it, all, this, all the structures are still well built and not stretched. Of course, I don't do it, but I do an EVD. <laughs> I mean, Henry, and this is why I, I, I like after a stressful surgery like that. I know it's not a lengthy surgery, but to me, it is a very, very stress, enjoyably stressful. I mean, <laughs> I love to do it, but I have to take care. I don't want to lose the patient overnight. And this is why, if it is possible, I do an ETV. If it is not possible, I leave an EVD to drain. And then in 24, 48 hours, I remove it. And I am happy with the result. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a way of doing it. I'm not uh, implying that everybody should do it, but uh, this is how I'm dealing with it. And I feel safer that way. And it's difficult to move away normally when you've got a big experience of doing something in a certain way and it's worked all the time to kind of move away from that. And do you put the, uh, the EVD in when you do the, uh, like a tubular retractor surgery or, or microscopic surgery, or do you do it only with the endoscopic ones? Well, if I have to, of course, if I'm doing, I'm dealing with a, uh, any septal, uh, septal lesion, uh, central neurocytoma or whatever, I like to put an EVD and I put it properly and I put it in a way not to occlude the echoduct. Mind you, it's very easy to push the tip of the, this EVD and you find yourself suddenly, and we found it in some cases, profuse, profuse CSF without with the patient fully conscious. So we just slipped it up or a couple of millimeters and everything was gone. So an EVD is 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 a life saving. I mean, I don't, I don't, to me they are life saving. And as I said, if the space does not allow it, then I put an EVD for forty eight hours, and I monitor the, the pressure, sort of intracranial pressure monitoring. You're not losing anything. I personally had a few situations with intraventricular tumors and and and. And sometimes even with ETVs, I tend to leave an access reservoir, a Rickham reservoir. It covers the hole quite nicely. And if we ever want to see if there's an infection, uh, we can tap it. Or if it blocks off, we can tap it. Of course, we do a lot of neonatal kind of you know procedures as well, where you sometimes expect the ETV is not going to work straight away or going to work as well. And even if you look at ETV success score, you know that it's going to be less likely. So as a result, I try and do that with everyone. So occasionally, I have had situations where I have left EVDs. And then when I've taken the EVD out months or years later, I've regretted it because the patient went off dramatically and I really needed someone to tap it and they were far away from us. And I really, and I still recall that someone who was 79, you could argue, should we, should we not have operated, but he had an ETV at a posterior fossa, brainstem carcinoma, carcinoma of unknown origin. And I debought that. And eventually we got him back to a local hospital and he was about to go home and then blocked off everything. And I said, ah, oh, well, you know, they could have tapped the reservoir and suddenly remembered he was one that I left an EVD in and I took it out. So there was no reservoir. So it's, we all kind of end up making decisions based on some patients that we've had like that. And what you said is, is absolutely key is there's no right and wrong, but the question is what's, what's worked for you, what's worked for Professor Schroeder and then saw for myself and others in the, in, in, in the audience and looking around and opening our eyes to everyone else that's doing things around us. Cause we all end up, 
sometimes guilty, I'm talking really of myself, not you guys, of just finding something that works and it looks like very attractive surgery and, and, and you, you kind of become a bit blinkered and you innovate to a point, but then you sometimes don't look around to see what others are also doing. And it's important to take note of that. And these webinars, Mansoor, thank you once, once again for organizing this, but are essential for people to discuss and to say, okay, well, here are all the, you know, you guys and the giants of neurosurgery who've been using endoscopy for years and years and years, and what are your views and what's your experience? So thank you guys for, for, for that kind of banter to and fro and, 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 and who does what. Mansoor. Uh, Basil, I, thank you so much. Uh, and, and thank you to Henry and Ahmad. Um, there's a quite an interesting uh, question just been posted. And I, in, in, in addition to reading this, I just wanted to also yourself and the masters to touch on two quick questions. One is this subject of sudden death which medical legally so many surgeons can be afraid of. And what's the guidance to that in terms of what size of cyst you would be worried about, what scan appearances and what symptoms. And in, in addition to that, a very common scenario which we face is when you've seen a colloid cyst which you're not going to intervene for, what surveillance do you do, if any? What, what is your, your recommendation on that? Maybe perhaps if, if we could have some comments on that from all three of you, uh, and then read the question from Mikhail with quite an extraordinary. Yes, that's a, that's a very intense uh, question. Yes, we'll yes. have to we'll have to read that uh, in, in detail. I think there was a paper recently. I, you guys will correct me that everyone was going by the Mayo Clinic. I think back in the day, in terms of size and so on. And then I think it was the Mayo Clinic from memory. And then there was a new paper a few years ago that said ten percent of colloid cysts will grow, and that all depended on the. Uh, consistency, what it looked like on the MRI scan, and of course the age of the patient. So a young patient and, a, and, and consistency on the MRI intensity that looked similar to CSF is more likely to grow with time. And as a result, you had to, I keep a close eye on them yearly, maybe every two years. Some of them might say, look, if I have headaches, I'll come back. I don't want to think about it, and that's fine. I've never seen sudden death in anyone that we followed up. So I think when they know they have a colloid and they have really bad headaches, they come and seek attention. Uh, and, and, and I think the ones that die are the ones that don't know they have a colloid. So they sit on a headache for days, weeks, maybe 25 years, like Professor Schroeder showed uh, someone, I think. I think it was, it was you, Professor. So I, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, but when, when, when you see a colloid cyst in a young patient and you see in a T2 weighted image, it's not black. So and you know it's a vital content, it's a vital cyst. It's it's an active dynamic process, in my opinion. And if you see there's already ventricular dilation, then I would always recommend to make surgery. Yep. And then usually they come because of headaches. They got the MRI. You know, sometimes the incidental findings because of other things. What I showed you the old lady. I don't know what she was afraid to have a stroke or so. And if you see the ventricles are open. They see it on the sagittal plane, yeah, there's still, or in the coronal plane, you see it even better. There is some space between the cyst and the foramen. There's no ventricular dilation. So I think then it's no need to make surgery just to say maybe you get sudden death, that it's not okay. But if you see a huge cyst, young patient, ventricular dilation, I always recommend to do surgery because you know it's a simple cyst and the consequences can be dramatic for the, for the patient. What we were told in the old days that uh, actually the colloid cyst is hanging from the roof as uh, with a pedicle and it goes to and fro and it is mobile and hence this is why the acuity suddenly it blocks both foramen and Monroe and they die. But this sudden issue is exaggerated. What we see is the patient gets severe headache over a day and then the second day he starts being drowsy. Of course, I cannot blame the relatives, but uh, actually when you see or discover an incidental finding, you should alarm the relatives that by any headache persisting, you should come anytime in the ER at any moment. Yeah. Because it might in 48 hours or less cause actual sudden death. I think it's very important when you have a young patient coming to you has not yet a scan and it's complaining of this pressure feeling and 
and usually when they have physical activity, it becomes worse, then you should make an image. That is very important. We had one patient, oh, yeah, also a young patient, and went to the neurology and they suspected meningitis and they make a lumbar puncture and immediately she herniated because you re release the pressure down. That is very dangerous. Yeah. It, so when we have young patients and they complain of headaches and that is not related to an, a viral infection or so, then we always advise to make an image. If this is a chronic process, of course, you don't do it anytime. But if it's the first attacks of headache and you don't know why, and it is no other uh, explanation for that, we should send the patients to make an image. I think this is probably one of the most important messages uh, of any talk. And I think increasingly, whether it's pediatric or even adults, there used to be a lot of diagnoses of migraines. And we've seen, and even we've had people who were sectioned and were called depressive syndromes of some description. And then later you find out they have a meningioma that's, you know, that's pressing on both frontal lobes. And we shouldn't be, and this should be a disaster and a, and a tragedy to miss things like that in this day and age, depending on where we are. And I appreciate in some places, it's not as easy to get an MRI, to get a CT, let alone an MRI. But in most other places where we can, I think it's important not to diagnose this, not to sit on headaches for too long. I think for everyone who's who's joined us, I think that's one of the most important uh, messages. I think we've got a couple of questions. I, I will leave the biggest question, Mikhail, in a, a, to, to, to last. I think there was uh, one uh, from Pierre uh, who said, uh, thanks a lot for the speech, and I would like to have more details about the management of colloidal cysts whose content is adherent. I presume you mean where the content is solid, which Professor Schroeder showed us, uh, and we saw some also from Professor Zohedi, where you, you use, you try it and suck, but if you can't, you try and remove the whole cyst in, in, in one go. Is that right? Is that how you guys feel the best thing to do if it's tough contents inside the uh, colloid? Yeah, but if it, it depends. If you have a firm content, and you have the cyst still in the third ventricle and you don't decompress it and you pull it through the small foramen, you can stretch the fornix. You can really damage it. So if you have this, then you have to remove it first. When you have a white foramen, of course, then you can take the whole cyst. But if it's really a small foramen, this happens, I have it also a case and I pulled on it and then you see the stretching of the fornix and I released it because then you might damage your phonics. So it depends from the anatomical situation. So on a case by <laughs> case, I think it's fair to say. Yeah, yes, yeah. and it depends you also open on the symptoms. Yeah, you can open the choroid fissure as you mentioned, and then you can have a larger cyst removed. Yes. The contents are either not only uh, uh, fluid-like or uh, hard contents, they could be in between. And this is also very tedious to remove. You can't suck it out, even when you do the maneuver that I have showed you with the uh, balloon catheter put behind it and squeezing the contents out uh, and sucking it. I mean, you're dual doing both squeeze and suck, but uh, sometimes it's not helpful. And you have to really, as Henry said, remove it in total. And this would be, as also pointed out, either go from anterior, more anterior, where you have already increased somehow or did some sort of a foramen of plasty to the to the foramen of Monroe without injuring the, the fornix and you start removing it piecemeal and the contents alone not the contents and the capsule yeah in order not to injure whatever especially the veins in this area and I think the the complex question here although uh, probably a statement to start with which is well thank 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 you both for an interesting webinar and uh, the uh, statement is that in the experience of endoscopic removal of colloid cysts, my understanding, Mikhail, just correct me if I'm wrong, there are two, more than 250 cases. Is that saying that you guys have done more than 250 endoscopic cases? Because that is a huge, huge series. I think so far, I'm not sure I hit 20. Um, and so we came to the be in China. Best. I, be don't, in China. I don't think that we together have 250 cases. We have much less. Yes, no, 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 but the, unless I mean, you're saying about reviewing the what phases we are reporting. I mean, there was a phase before the endoscopy, which was solely and was also reported by the team in Castellani, and then they were solely microsurgical. And then we went into solely endoscopic, and then we went to uh, endoscope assisted. Both the solely endoscopic and endoscope assisted would mount in my group, because there are other groups within the department who love to do colloid cysts. Everyone does, yeah. <laughs> 
So we have uh, 57, 58 now. Yes, today. and they tend to be smaller numbers. So I think 250 is a huge case series. If you can just I, uh, no, no, qualify, yeah, if that's if that's what Mikhail, if, if that's what your experience is, and that's amazing, uh, tell us a little bit more. But you said you came to the conclusion that if there's a risk of bleeding, it is not necessary to strive for total removal of the cyst capsule. Total coagulation is sufficient. In our series, we tracked six recurrences with this approach. If you have six recurrences out of 250 cases, that's very good. Um, what do you think about the need to strive for total removal of the capsule, or would partial removal of the capsule maximal coagulation? If it is not sticky, sufficient? if you can do remove it without any problems, without every now and then a, a spillage of uh, venous blood that can can end up very badly. Okay, if not, you yeah. can start with the ball electrode, bipolar ball electrode, and go on it and don't uh, be patient until you really uh, coagulate it. And then uh, there is the major issue. I don't know personally, and I don't know if you know from the literature, where does it originally originate from? From within the velum interpositum or from one of the leaves upper or lower? I don't know. I sincerely don't know. I would love to know. <laughs> one day perhaps i haven't really figured it out i just see it coming from the roof and, <laughs> and i haven't normally pushed my my anatomy of it uh, uh, any harder i think i've not normally I, I mean i coagulate the cyst but i found i've done it with a choroid plexus cyst and sometimes when you coagulate them they become a bit tougher they go from really this flimsy kind of capsule that it becomes smaller and, and tougher but then you can remove them easier i've tried to always take the whole thing out but maybe I'm guilty of pushing too hard the last few bits because leaving a tiny little residual, I don't think gives you a huge recur a recurrence. I think leaving most of it, if you coagulated most of it, then then it's more likely to start reforming contents and growing again. Professor Schroeder, do you think that's a fair um, um, statement? Yes, so I usually try to make a gross total resection, but if it's a tiny piece, which is difficult to reach and you see as a risk to damage oh. your internal cerebral veins, of course you can leave it, but if it's a significant amount, you will get recurrence. In our first series, which we published some years ago in World Surgery, we had three recurrence because there was, what well, let's say maybe four square millimeters of the cyst. So yeah. if you look with nanoscope, it looks very huge. And this uh, causes recurrence. So we try to avoid it because when we measure the success of endoscopic technique, we have to compare to microsurgical series. Yeah. And they, they, when you look at the new series, they have a good results, less memory problems and less recurrence rate. Then everybody will say, why do you do the business endoscope when you, not, when you cannot achieve the same result? So no, even the complication rate is not so high with a transcalosal approach or even with a um, transcortic approach when you have huge ventricles. I saw a systematic review and I'm trying to remember, we're trying to put up our case series. It's, it's modest compared to, to both your series and certainly the 250 patients, but I thought it's important to report it. Um, and when I looked, there was, the, there was a systematic review, I believe, where when they looked at endoscopic uh, drainage of the cysts, yes, of course, there were a lot more recurrences with those. But when they looked at endoscopic resections versus microscopic resections, it was very similar. And that's the take home message is, it's the surgery that you're doing, not necessarily what you're using to visualize and what instrumentation. If you're able to take the whole cyst with an endoscope without causing damage to fornix or any, anything else, then that's great. Then you, you shouldn't have recurrences or you know, maybe you'll have the odd one, which we should really find out why. If you do it microscopically and you don't have any complications and any problems, then that's great. The question which Bassam has asked now is, do I think, or you guys, colloid cysts should be managed in designated centers due to low volume? I think that's a very uh, charged question. Most people will say yes, uh, who do colloid cysts because they feel, well, you know, as, as Professor Zuhudi said, everyone likes doing them. But the reality is there is increasing subspecialization in the same way as a lot of people will do vascular or functional epilepsy. It's fair to say intraventricular tumors that require certain skills and expertise, be it tubular retractors or endoscope or endoscopic assisted uh, approaches, probably are, uh, it's fair to say those who do them a lot of the time will have a better chance maybe at getting better outcomes, but it's a very tricky question to answer. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah, it's very, very difficult. When you sure. say this, of course, then other people are very angry with you because they also want to have the college cyst, but it is with anything. If you have 
you need a, a certain amount of cases. It's difficult to say how much is it, is it 10 or 20 or 30? But you know, when you have a surgery for the first time, it's always more risky. You are unsure what to do, what is the consistency where I expect which, which anatomical problem. And then of course you need a certain amount to, be, to feel safe and to, to, to have a good result of this, this with any surgical technique. When you do the first one, when I should do a scoliosis surgery, it would be a disaster because I have never done it. And the same is when you have never done a colloid cyst and you have never done similar surgeries to colloid cysts, then maybe it's better you, you transfer the patient to a colleague who has more experience with this. And I think having endoscopic, I feel the same about pineals, having endoscopic experience is essential. So a lot of our pineals, I think a lot of people will maybe do one or two a year or so on. And we managed to have something like, I think over 30, I think I've had more pineals and colloid cysts, which is odd, but they are more common. And we do a lot of pediatrics here. And increasingly, there used to be this problem of, do you do CSF tumor markers and wait for those? Do you go in for a biopsy and so on? Whereas now with the choroid fissure split, I do an ETV and do a biopsy. And then we know exactly what tumor we're dealing with. And then we therefore can proceed with a resection or, you know, sometimes we've even been able to take the whole thing out endoscopically from the top. So I think having those skills, if you're going to operate in ventricles, but you cannot use an endoscope, I think it's a bit tricky for me to get my head around that. Even if you're taking, if you can do both, but you decide to take them all with a microscope, that's fine. But sometimes some of the complications you have may be most amenable to endoscopy. So you should have both techniques, I think, endoscopic and microscopic, if you're going to operate within ventricles. Is that a fair comment? Absolutely correct. Yes. Um, hope that answers a, your questions. That's a quick uh, comment regarding this because it, it comes up in so many webinars and in meetings. Uh, this is one of the reasons we're trying to develop this speciality, which you guys are so key in, in, in this panel. Um, there is obviously, there is no obvious answer to that last question, um, but we have to be realistic. Some of our friends around the world work in large countries. If you work in Canada and it's a two hour plane ride to the nearest neurosurgical center, it's different. And in the UK, it's different. Um, but I think it's without a doubt that um, exposure matters, training matters, um, and where possible, it should be uh, in, a, in a specialized center or even in small centers where there's collaboration between colleagues to help each other. Yeah. And another factor is that when people get really good at something, God forbid, they can let their guard down and, and not prepare uh, as well as we can. Um, and, and I think that's um, an important point to, to mention. And one other thing which Ahmed said, which really caught my ears, and I want to share it with you to see what you think. One of my relatives once told me, your patients should leave your clinic happier than when they came in. And I've tried to do this for years. And I think this is one of the things we really aspire to do. And Ahmad mentioned about sudden death. And you know how patients can be terrified of this entity, this possibility of sudden death. And I find realistically to reassure them, to say, don't worry, you're not going to, to the best of my knowledge, ever suddenly die from this. If you get symptoms, come straight away. So they, you know, they've not been, according to the analysis we've done in the literature, any, anyone ever just walking along and then suddenly dropping dead from this. They've had symptoms at least for some hours, if not for days or weeks. And I wonder what uh, you know what you guys think. And Henry and Ahmed and yourself have really beautifully reviewed this. But this is, I think, an important reassurance to tell patients that uh, you know we're close by and you will have symptoms. You won't just suddenly deteriorate from some nothing to something and then drop just a... i don't i wouldn't like to reassure them too much put this in mind <laughs> because uh, <laughs> they would say ah oh, this is very i would like to reassure them as you said but they have to put it very clear in their mind not to belittle whatever kind of symptom mentioned in a small paper that they take with them if you have this, you have this and that, that, please don't hesitate to come into the ER, not for. Bearing in mind, they might want to go abroad and they might have to make decisions depending on where they're going to be. So especially if they have a relatively big mm -hmm. colloid cyst, sometimes they say, well, they want to know where the neurosurgical units are depending on where they're going. 
And occasionally you have some that say, well, we're going to the, you know, the Amazon rainforest. And you go, well, if you twist your ankle there, you're in big trouble. So it doesn't matter if you have a colloid cyst and hydrocephalus because you're not going to make it to, to a hospital in, in enough time. Perfect. Well, I think it's been a really nice um, and, and insightful and actually fascinating look from all aspects at colloid cysts, uh, almost as if we've looked at it with a microscope and an endoscope at the same time. Uh, so thank you both very much, Mansoor. Thank you very much for inviting me. And uh, I think if no one else has any questions, Mansoor, do you think we can call to a close? Absolutely. I mean, I think uh, it's been a pleasure for me too just to listen to the dialogue between all three of you. And you've, you've conducted this beautifully, Basil. We're very, very grateful. And we really appreciate, particularly in the UK, your experience on this and your input and I hope for the years to come. And uh, as I was saying to... Henry and Ahmad, or I was saying to Henry earlier, I feel like sometimes the moon uh, that benefits from the sun when, uh, <laughs> from all the light that is reflected. When I, in the presence of, you know, people like Henry and Ahmad who, who have this huge experience and just to learn and listen and, and, and absorb this wisdom. And I think you've reviewed the subject so well. I've made some notes here from the size of the cyst to the consistency, spontaneous rupture. I've seen some things and learned about partial resection, endoscopic sheath methods, uh, hemostasis techniques, the use of the pneumatic arm really interested me, and um, particularly I think I've learned quite a bit there. Thank you, Henry. Uh, and uh, how you stop the bleeding and address these things. So I think you've touched on every crucial element. So thank you all. Brilliant. Excellent, Basil, and excellent, Henry and, and Ahmed. Thank you. Thank you we'll, all. We'll call it a day. God bless you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Wonderful. You. Wonderful. Thanks for your kind invitation. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Mansoor.